Hey, welcome to Memorizing Pharmacology Question, Answers, and Rationales, Book 1. Uh, this is the video uh, that precedes the audiobook. So uh, you watch the video for maybe 18 minutes and uh, get as many notes down as you can. Uh, and then the audiobook is actually uh, closer to two hours long. Uh, but that is all of the questions, answers, and rationales that relate to gastrointestinal pharmacology uh, and are basically the test preparation. Uh, if you really want the uh, full course, uh, you can do the full pharmacology course with the mobile quizzes uh, instead at memorizingpharm.com forward slash mobile. Uh, but let's get on with gastrointestinal pharmacology uh, book one video welcome to gastrointestinal pharmacology we'll go over peptic ulcer disease and also constipation diarrhea emesis and GI autoimmune disorders which we'll just kind of lump together so let's start with peptic ulcer disease and kind of what it is and what it isn't uh, first uh, the pathology begins with the stomach. The acidic di digestive enzymes have a pH around 2, so it's a pretty hostile environment. Ulcerations are lining breaks in the stomach, or the duodenum. So it goes from the stomach to the duodenum, uh, the small intestine. And then three, the presentation, usually there's burning pain one to three hours after eating. It may get worse after lying down overnight. The way to think about it, or one way to think about it is as peptic ulcer disease invaders and defenders. So our invaders include our knight with his hammer and his shield uh, made up of H. pylori, NSAIDs, gastric acid, pepsin, which is an enzyme, and smoking. These five uh, invaders or causes of peptic ulcer disease can damage the stomach or the duodenum, whereas our defenders or our protectors include mucus, bicarbonate, blood flow, and prostaglandins. So let's talk a little bit more about the invaders or causes first. Helicobacter pylori uh, is a gram-negative bacillus. It colonizes in between the epithelium and the mucus layer, and this is the most common cause. 60 to 70 percent of the time, this is the reason for the ulceration. Second are the NSAIDs. So they block prostaglandin synthesis. This results in less blood flow, protective mucus production, and bicarbonate. We have acid and pepsin. Uh, when, the muco when the protective mucus layer is damaged, acid and pe pepsin can injure the GI system. And then smoking. This will delay healing of ulcers and increase acidity. The peptic ulcer de disease defenses, or the castle, include the mucus layer. So the GI mucosa secretes mucus forming a protective barrier to acid and pepsin. Bicarbonate will neutralize the acid from the stomach. Blood flow, so slow blood flow will, can lead to cell injury, so we want normal blood flow. And prostaglandins stimulate the mucus and bicarbonate secretion, and these are the protectors. So what do we do to treat it? Well, it depends on what kind of severity we have. Uh, we can start with antacids just to see if you know neutralizing the acid will help. So we'll stick with two of them to start, calcium carbonate, which is brand Tums. This neutralizes stomach acid to raise the pH. It's a chewable tablet, but it can be constipating. On the other end, in comparison, is magnesium hydroxide, or milk of magnesia. It neutralizes the stomach acid to raise the pH. It's a liquid suspension, generally, and it's a laxative effect. So constipating versus laxative effect. And then just some notes. Uh, we want to take one to three hours after a meal. Uh, it's no less effective than histamine 2 receptor antagonists, which we'll talk about in a minute, or proton pump inhibitors, but it's more inconvenient to take it that many times a day. It's not for preventing dyspepsia, only treating it, and both calcium carbonate and magnesium hydroxide can bind to tetracyclines and fluoroquinolone antibiotics, decreasing their effectiveness. Peptic ulcer disease treatment histamine 2 receptor antagonists. Well, histamine 2 receptors line the stomach, helping secrete gastric acid. And the two antagonists we'll talk about are famotidine, brand Pepsid, and ranitidine, brand Zantac. And you'll notice that their endings are the same. That's not coincidental. After a certain year, we started keeping the endings the same for the same chemical entities. And 
Most of the time, the same chemical entity will be in the same therapeutic class, but we'll see as we get to neuro with like oxetine or something like that, you will see that uh, it might have different therapeutic indications with the same chemical structures or similar chemical structures. But focusing on this right now, famotidine will block H2 receptors, prevent acid secretion, as will ranitidine, and we don't want to use for more than 14 days if we're just taking it over the counter. Uh, the physician, of course, or prescriber can make it longer. Some notes, we take it an hour before the meal to reduce that acid. It's best for nighttime GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, caused more by histamine, really. Cimetidine, or Tagamet, which is the first one that came out, it's a histamine 2 receptor antagonist, causes adverse effects in many drug interactions. And long-term use can put patients at pneumonia risk. What we want to do is just picture that here we have this acidic environment that normally destroys bacteria and then we reduce it so uh, we open the body up to this bacteria and pneumonia. Peptic ulcer disease proton pump inhibitors of antacids, H2 blockers, these are the newest but they're certainly not new. Omeprazole and esomeprazole. We see that they both have the prazole ending and this lets us know that it's a proton pump inhibitor. And we'll see that there's a little bit of an issue with something like aripiprazole, where the piprazole ending is lets us know that this one is for schizophrenia. But right now, prazole is uh, PPI. Omeprazole is brand Prilosec, and it shuts off the stomach proton pumps and raises the gastric pH, where esomeprazole or Nexium also does the same, but it is the S isomer of omeprazole. So omeprazole is actually a combination of a left and right handed chemical, whereas esomeprazole is just the S or the left handed side. The S stands for sinister, which in Latin literally was if you were left handed, you were sinister or that's how they thought of you. Uh, and what it's supposed to be is that, well, if there's two sides to it and only one side does anything, well, let's just use the one side. And that's why esomeprazole came along. So notes, usually take it 30 minutes before the first meal of the day. There is going to be one exception to this. One of the proton pump inhibitors doesn't require this. But uh, in general, that's the expectation. You can take up to seven days to work. So um, unlike an antacid, which will resolve some of the acid right away, this can take some time. Uh, we want to taper when stopping to avoid rebound hypersecretion. So let's break that down real quick. Rebound meaning... Okay, so we've been in a position and now we bounce back. So if we've reduced the acid somewhat and we all of a sudden stop giving these, then the body will create a ton of acid because it was trying to compensate for the loss of acid from these drugs. So hyper meaning above and then secretion. So rebound hypersecretion means there's a significant amount of acid that comes out. Uh, long term, we can... We're concerned about osteoporosis, fractures, hypomagnesemia, um, but uh, we expect that hopefully uh, we only have to use in the short term. So treatment steps, if the ulcer is from H. pylori, we expect to use at least two antibiotics and an antisecretory agent like a proton pump inhibitor. So we're going to have three different medications all at once. And there are other ways to do it, but this is one of the most common. If, however, we have non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, we try to DC the NSAID if possible, because some patients can't. If you have arthritis and this arthritis is keeping you from functioning, then the patient has to have the NSAID. But we try to stop the offending agent. And then we'll use histamine 2 receptor antagonists or proton pump inhibitors. We want to just create an environment that's best for healing. So I will not, we're not really healing the ulcer. What we're doing is creating an environment where the ulcer can repair itself. So non-drug treatments that we can use. So the best of them is to eat five or six small meals daily. Um, if you eat a big meal, a lot of acid goes in the stomach. If you eat a little meal, a little acid goes in. So we get less acid naturally. Avoiding smoking, which can lead to extra secretion of acid. Stopping those NSAIDs and aspirin. Avoiding alcohol and caffeine. And reducing stress as much as possible. But of these, really, the five to six small meals daily tends to be the one that's the most effective.
constipation, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and GI autoimmune disorders. So when we look at constipation and the pathology, the first point is that we have primary constipation. This is caused by slowed or delayed transit, maybe the bowel is obstructed, or secondary constipation. Maybe it's the diet and lack of fiber. Maybe it's lifestyle. Maybe it's medications. Maybe it's underlying conditions. So uh, those are the two different constipations we'll talk about. In terms of treatment, let's do a look at it generally, then we'll look at specific uh, drugs themselves. Uh, we can use bulk forming laxatives, we can use surfactant, osmotic, or stimulant. The big difference is some of them just bring water into the bowel to get more of a mush, and the others are really propelling things out, and it's more of a push. So let's look at some of the names. Bulk forming, we have psyllium, which is brand metamucil, which is very much like fiber that would come in the diet. Docusate sodium is colase. Often we see this with opioids. Polyethylene glycol, two very different forms. Miralax is a powder that comes over the counter that's relatively safe. And then Go Lightly is uh, bowel prep. So a completely different um, intention with both of them, but it's the same medication. And then the stimulant senna, uh, this is something that uh, if things are not going well, you can more push than create this mush. So if you want to think about mush versus push as bulk forming and surfactants make it easier to go, making everything mushier, uh, but stimulants as osmotic push a bowel movement forward, which is a little bit different. So let's start with the laxatives bulk forming mush, uh, the psyllium or metamucil. It acts like fiber in the diet. It swells with water to increase fecal mass and softness. It's the preferred temporary constipation treatment, minimal side effects. Uh, notes, you will want to talk with the patients about dietary fiber. Maybe you can change their diet and they don't have to take this. Uh, you do want to mix well with liquids before taking and it can take up to three days to produce a bowel movement. So often patients are expecting something to happen relatively quickly. Want to make sure to let them know that that's not how it works. Another one is the surfactant docusate sodium or colase and this lowers the stool surface tension. Water enters the feces and the issue we want to worry about is making sure that they're hydrated. So you take with water to prevent dehydration as water leaves the body with the stool. It produces a bowel movement in one to three days, so a little bit faster than the psyllium, and it should be given to everyone taking an opioid medication. Another medication that's on the stimulant side is Senna, and we use stimulants after fiber and stool softeners fail. But unfortunately, these are often used and abused I uh, expect a bowel movement within 12 hours or overnight, and tablets and suppositories are available. And this is a bit of impatience. Obviously, the patient's uncomfortable, they may have waited too long, and they want something to happen right away. The osmotic, again, there's two different sides to it. The polyethylene glycol, which is the Miralax, it's gentle over the counter, okay for children, versus the bowel prep before colonoscopy. So two very different uses of the same medication. Uh, the polyethylene glycol produces a bowel movement within 72 hours for the Miralax. Uh, but with the polyethylene glycol, it happens very quickly. You need to be near a toilet. Uh, but make sure the patients are drinking fluids. Uh, there is a risk of dehydration. Diarrhea pathology is a change in the normal bowel movements characterized by unusually softer liquid stools three or more times in 24 hours, and, but lasting less than two weeks. So some of the common causes, maybe it's viral, bacterial, parasite, maybe it's another drug, maybe it's food allergies, maybe it's GI conditions. Most important to know that a diarrhea issue is not a disease, it's simply a symptom of something else going on. Soloparamide is brand Imodium. Uh, this is a weak over-the-counter opioid. It's for diarrhea not of infectious origin and reduces the volume of discharge from ileostomies. Diphenoxylate with atropine is a step up. It's Lomotil. It's a controlled substance. Uh, the atropine discourages abuse. Someone would be able to crush the diphenoxylate and inject it. Uh, high doses can bring on a morphine-like response. So uh, we want to be careful not to give too much of this, but again, this is a step up from the loperamide if that's not working. 
Uh, some kind of, if we had some kind of overdose, we would treat it with naloxone. Uh, bismol subsalicylate or Pepto-Bismol. Uh, so the OTC is available as liquid or chewable tablets. Uh, it causes this harmless black stool and black tongue, but it might surprise the patient if they're not familiar with it. And then children's Pepto is not bismol subsalicylate. You can't give a salicylate to a child. Uh, so instead, it's calcium carbonate, which is basically Tums. Uh, but the manufacturer wanted to keep the Pepto because it's recognizable. So again, avoid in children due to the risk of rise syndrome because of that salicylate component. Uh, if it's infectious, like Escheria coli or E. coli, it's usually self-limiting, but you may see ciprofloxacin or Cipro. Uh, there are new FDA guidelines regarding the use for minor urinary tract infections uh, and respiratory infections, but this is something you might see. So again, if there's an infection, then we're going to give some kind of antibiotic. Emesis or vomiting. Uh, usually it's caused by the activation of the vomiting center in the brain. So the indirect activation happens when the chemoreceptor trigger zone is first activated. And then this goes on to activate the vomiting center. We're going to talk about three types of emesis. So the first is anticipatory, before the drug is gr given. So it's triggered by the memory of severe nausea from a previous dose. Acute, which is minutes after giving, it resolves within hours or then delayed, it may take more than a day after, and it appears 48 to 72 hours after chemotherapy. The first we'll look at is a dopamine antagonist, or an antiemetic. So it blocks dopamine 2 receptors in the CTZ, or the chemoreceptor trigger zone. It prevents activation, and it's useful for emesis caused by surgery, or cancer, or chemotherapy, and toxins. Uh, promethazine or phenergan is the brand and it's contraindicated for children under two but it is available as a suppository if they're actively vomiting and they can't take something orally but it can cause extra pyramidal effects because of the lack of dopamine another drug the 5-HT3 serotonin receptor antagonist or ondansetron which is brand Zofran uh, this was first approved for chemotherapy and it was really a breakthrough when it came out because we didn't have something for chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting or CINV uh, for regular emesis uh, and CINV and it's available as a tablet an orally disintegrating tablet that just dissolves on the tongue and then IV it can cause prolonged QT interval and for potentially torsade de pont uh, with VTAC uh, but generally the common side effects are just headache dizziness a little diarrhea uh, which are much less uh, severe than the nausea or vomiting that someone would have. And then we'll just look at the autoimmune disorders, uh, just comparing ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. So this GI autoimmune pathology or irritable bowel disease, um, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, can be caused by an exaggerated immune response to the normal bowel flora. So ulcerative colitis, it's an inflammation of the mucosa and submucosa of the colon and rectum, can cause rectal bleeding and may require hospitalization. Crohn's disease is characterized by transmural inflammation, and it usually affects the terminal ileum, but it can affect all parts of the GI tract. We don't have cure for it, but we do have some treatments. Uh, the five, um, the treatments, not curative, so only relieve symptoms. Uh, the five amino salicylates like sulfasalazine and mesalamine, so there's a salicylate component there. Glucocorticoids, steroids, hydrocortisone, dexamethasone. Immunosuppressants, so trying to suppress the immune system and the immune response, azathioprine, cyclosporin, and methotrexate. Antibiotics like metronidazole or ciprofloxacin. And then immunomodulators like infliximab, which affect the immune system. And let's look at that one. So infliximab, or Remicade, this is a monoclonal antibody, and we can see the ending, MAB, uh, designed to neutralize tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF, a key in immunoinflammatory modulator. Uh, it's for moderate or severe Crohn's, and it has to be given by IV infusion, leading to some infusion reactions, and then we have an increased list risk of lymphoma. And that makes sense when you're messing with the immune system, you're reducing the immune response. Note, uh, we have to screen patients for tuberculosis and other infections before starting infusion uh, because of that uh, immune suppression, and then infusion reactions happen every time. So you can 
prevent it hopefully after the first infusion.